Our uh, speaker today is uh, Dr. Jason Smith. Um, he's an associate professor in the School of Forest, Fisheries, and Geomatic Sciences here at UF. Um, and he's going to be talking to us today about the consequences of novel encounters with forest fungi. So thank you very much again, Jason, for being here. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It was um, really nice to be invited to speak. And uh, I am really excited to talk to you about this work we're doing. Um, I think it's it's kind of cool. In my my opinion, I think it's cool, at least. Um, we're doing some work that um, in in a lot of ways is, I think, uh, yeah, very novel. Uh, it, we Historically, my lab has worked on tree pathogens. We've been working on fungal pathogens that affect forests. Um, and in, you know, over time, we've kind of shifted a little bit. We're starting to work on what I consider to be, uh, kind of falls into this, this sort of this uh, definition of what we might call one health maybe. Um, more recently, we're working on uh, these fungal pathogens that are uh, have uh, hosts that occur on uh, Path or that occur on trees, but then also have the potential to uh, um, be a, occur on humans as well. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But what I want to what I want to say is, fungi are um, everywhere, and I think one one of the things that has struck me recently is the emergence of, of fungal pathogens globally. It's really something that we're we're seeing um, a lot of information coming out all the time. There's there's new um, new studies um, that that suggest that fungi have the potential to really become uh, problematic in a lot of situations that we didn't maybe think. And there's a lot of change, a lot of reasons for this. Um, the um, just a couple of days ago, um, my, one of my faculty colleagues brought this Scientific American over to me and asked me if I'd seen it. And um, I, I thought maybe this might these these uh, uh, pictures from it might actually be good to put in this presentation. Um, there's a lot of concerns about maybe some of the next, uh, you know, big killers being fungi. And there's some reasons for this. You know, humans, of course, we our primary pathogens are bacteria and, and viruses, you know, as, as you know, are, you know, those are the microbes that are most well suited for living in the human body. Um, the human body, of course, is 37 degrees, uh, or, or roughly in it. It's, or, or, and it's, it's a, it's, it's, um, our, our conditions are, um, not suited for most fungi. Most fungi are, are able to live in other, other, con, you know, sort of other conditions, but there are fungi that are adapting and there's, there's, there's reasons for this. One, one thing that's happening in a lot of cases is that we're seeing a lot of uh, dr drug resistant um, fungi developing. Um, in, the, in the landscape, um, we're, we're using a lot of fungicides, whether it be in clinical settings or in the, the agricultural settings that we, we use fungicides, we're, we're selecting for resistance. And this is happening um, with a lot of different species. One being Candida auris, you may have heard of this, this yeast that is um, emerging and becoming a major killer in a lot of different parts of the globe. Um, this, this one in particular is kind of a little bit perplexing because they had, uh, we've had these sort of um, multiple emergences of um, fungicide resistant strains of Candida auris emerge. Um, and they emerged in different parts of the world, which is kind of interesting. And there's really sort of several hypotheses about why this might have happened, but um, it's not real clear at this point why this is, you know, why it happened sort of at the same time and in different independent sort of, diff there were different independent origins of this. But nonetheless, um, it's something that is, is pretty interesting to me because Candida auris has um, environmental uh, pools, if you will, in terms of its, its natural history. It, it basically occurs on uh, plants, probably in swampy kind of settings and things like that, which I'll show you a slide here in a second on that. But in, there's, there's several different, um, different fungal pathogens that, that are doing this. It's not just Candida auris. Aspergillus is another one. So aspergillus um, is, a, is a common mold. There's a lot of different species of aspergillus. Um, and aspergillus causes uh, aspergillosis in, in humans. There's also, as, there's, there are a few aspergillus that can be plant pathogens as well, but there's a, a lot of aspergillus species out there and a lot of them are common molds. In fact, if you, if you leave your uh, fruit, you know, just sitting around like oranges and things like that, you might find aspergillus sometimes will even grow on them. But there's a lot of aspergillus species that are, are human pathogens. And some of them will infect in, infect your lungs. They they can so we can we can get infections that way. Some of them can cause 
uh, uh, systemic infections in the blood. There's, there's lots of different types of in, um, aspergillus infections. We call that aspergillosis. But anyway, what's happening with some of these aspergillus species is because they're so widespread in the landscape as, as saprobes, that is living on dead plant material, they're encountering fungicides that are being used. And fun the fungicides that are being widespread, wi being used widespread in the landscape are these azole fungicides. They are very effective. They um, have become sort of the most uh, commonly used and most effective fungicides in many agricultural settings. And they are, um, they're, they are uh, promoting, um, because of the widespread use, the establishment of fungicide resistant strains of some of these aspergillus species. And so these, these fungicide resistant strains eventually make their way into clinical settings where they infect humans. And when they do, uh, these, these humans, when they get infected, of course, can't be, they, they can't be treated because the same fungicides that are used to treat, um, to treat these humans happen to be the same class of fungicides, these azole fungicides. Um, there, aren't, there aren't a lot of fungicides that can be used in humans because most of them are toxic to humans as well. And so <clears throat> anyway, this has become a, become a big issue. I just wanted to, to sort of put this information out there at the very beginning of my presentation because it's important for some things I'm going to talk about later. So that candid oris, which I mentioned a second ago, um, this, this particular yeast is, um, it's, it's, its natural history or its origin in the environment isn't really well documented. It's not really well known. It's, it's thought to maybe occur in wetland settings. Um, it, it's, it's been documented in a few situations associated with, plant, with plants. Um, it's not really clearly um, understood where it occurs for the most part. It is, but it, like I said, it's showing up um, in humans as, as, we, as we see these infections occurring. Um, it, it is very thermotolerant and it's thought that maybe um, birds could be moving it around and it's making it into, uh, into these rural settings where again, we're seeing uh, fungicide resistance, which you know, suggests that perhaps we're, there's some sort of um, scenario where there, there could be uh, interaction with you know, fungicide use, perhaps in agricultural settings or some other situation similar to what is going on with asper aspergillus. Um, another, another fungus which um, has a, a, an interesting um, sort of relationship between natural settings and clinical settings is uh, cryptococcus. So cryptoco cryptococcus is a, is a, a basidiomycete and this, it's a yeast. And this particular fungus um, has a relationship with trees. So this particular um, fungus lives mostly in decayed or hollowed out trees. And, and it actually is, is um, found in a wide range of different tree species. In fact, it's been found every, in everything from wobbly pine, which we have here in the Southeast to eucalyptus trees and other parts of the world, um, a wide range of different tree species, in fact. And, it, and furthermore, it's been found that in, for, in order for it to complete its life, its life cycle and for, for it to reproduce sexually, it needs to uh, 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 be growing on the tree host to do that. But it actually um, produces spores which are airborne, and those airborne spores are um, are sometimes, um, you know, br br they are sometimes inhaled by humans. And depending on the strain of the fungus and depending on the condition of the human host, you, get, um, you can get infections. And historically, these cryptococcus species have only really been problems for people that, are, that have some sort of immunosuppression. Some, usually it was HIV you know, patients or sometimes ca you know, cancer patients, people like that, people who had some sort of suppressed immune system. But more recently, we're seeing the emergence of strains of cryptococcus, particularly in places like the Pacific Northwest, British Columbia, places like that, where strains of cryptococcus are emerging that actually are able to infect immunocompetent individuals, people that actually don't have immunosuppression. And <clears throat> so this is, this is actually pretty concerning. Um, and and what, what, what happens is you get infections that can lead to things like meningitis types of and, and infections that can be pretty, pretty serious and, and can affect uh, various uh, organs. In some cases, it's the lungs. Some cases, it's the, um, the uh, spinal cord. Sometimes it's the brain. And it can lead to, you know, death eventually if, if, it's, if it's not treated quickly. And, 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 and again, the treatment of this is very difficult in many cases. 
The biology of this is, is still very poorly understood, but what's interesting is there have been um, recent studies that have shown that cryptococcus can infect plants. And we can see that there, this pathogen is actually able to infect plant, uh, plants in some cases. And so it's not just actually decayed, hollowed out dead trees, but actually this can be a pathogen on plants in some cases. What, what the genetics are of, of those strains and how they relate to uh, the, the strains that are the most pathogenic on uh, human hosts is yet to be determined. But uh, it is interesting that, like I said, um, we know that at least sexual reproduction occurs on, on the tree hosts. And so this, this is something that kind of got me pretty interested in, in sort of what I've been working on more recently. And, and, and like I said, um, it, it, it piqued my interest whenever I first learned about cryptococcus and, and, and sort of led to some of the, uh, some of the research questions I've started to look at more recently. So, so this le led, uh, so this leads me to kind of the more the sort of the first little research project I'm going to talk to you about. So one day I was walking around in one of the uh, retail stores here in town, um, one of the home goods stores. I think it was actually like uh, I don't I don't even know for sure which one it was. Actually, I, I think it it was um, Pure One Imports. Actually, I don't know why I was even in there. I think I was in there with with my family or something. We were just walking around, and I'm, I happened to look down at some some something it was like a maybe a wooden bowl or something and I looked at it and I don't know why but I what caught my attention was that it had bark on it and I was just started started thinking about it and you know one thing led to another and I just in my mind I started thinking about the idea you know thinking back to these um well what I'd recently learned about cryptococcus actually at the time this was several years ago and I was thinking to myself hmm I wonder I wonder if there could be you know, fungal pathogens in these, you know, wooden bowls that are being sold here, you know, because these are bowls that people are using for food, you know, for food preparation and things. And, and I flipped the bowl over and furthermore, I saw that the bowl was actually being shipped from the Philippines. It was sold, you know, this was something that was, that was being um, imported. It was not even from, a, it wasn't a domestic source. And that got me kind of my mind thinking even further about the idea that maybe, you know, there could be fungal pathogens that are not even, uh, that aren't endemic, you know, being spread on, on these products. And so, um, so, you know, I, I start looking around and I, when, you know, I start seeing products that are being sold like this here, this, this is actually a, it, this is a kind of a, it's a bowl, but it's not really a solid bowl. This is actually like a, a little basket type thing. And this basket is made from a combination of, uh, this so this is actually from the Philippines, by the way, too. I don't have this on here, but this is actually a, a basket that's made in the Philippines. It's made from uh, a combination of driftwood and um, some sort of like weaved material. And if you look at what the label says here, it says reclaim reclaim what time has forgotten and invite a small piece of nature into your home. From centerpieces, accessories, and furniture, we help build your style from the ground up. And it says recoup features amazing decor for your home and from reclaimed wood from the east. Lifted from beaches and regions of reforested land, the natural history of each piece is preserved, strengthening your connection to the earth. And this is, like I said, this is from the Philippines. And I, I looked at the, I started to look at this a little bit and I see here what looks like actual living fungal uh, growth on on the wood. This blue, this blue green material that you see in the lower left is actually uh, characteristic of uh, blue stain fungi um, or green stain fungi. There are different types of fungi that actually can do this, and I, I I really got interested in this. So one thing led to another, and I thought, well, you know what? Why don't we collect some samples and do a little study on this? And to give you a little bit of background information here on this, as we begin. The way this the, this market is is actually um, is is regulated, APHIS USDA APHIS is who regulates this material, and they're, 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 the current regulations are such that this is regulated under what's called ha uh, wooden handicrafts. Okay, wooden handicrafts are are regulated in a way that if the if the products are are under a certain size, if they're under one inch in diameter, and um, and um, they don't have um, any, they're not supposed to have any bark on them. They um, can be imported from a long list of already pre-approved exporters. Um, and if they, if they are, if they fall into that category, basically nothing needs to be done. They, they can, they, 
they basically are approved. And the, the assumption is, is that those exporters are doing what they're supposed to do in terms of bio, biosafety regulations, which is um, they, the wood is supposed to have gone through either, they're supposed to have either been uh, sterilized through, sterilized in quotes, by the way, with either uh, 60 degrees C um, for, um, they're, they're either supposed to have been treated with 60 degrees C for up to, for at least one hour, or they were supposed to have been uh, treated with methyl bromide. Okay, this is this is what the regulations state. Now, the if if they um, want to export import from an exporter that's not on those lit on that list, and those are only from China, by the way. If they're not coming from one of those one of those one of those exporters, which are not from China, then they they basically are supposed to be um, they're they're supposed to be treated with, with one of those two treatments. And 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 based there or they you know they're not supposed to be imported basically. But we don't really know for sure if there's no guarantee that they're necessarily going through those treatments. We don't know that with certainty um, for one thing. And and even if they are, we know for a fact that a lot of fungi can survive those treatments. Um, there, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of literature on what what fungi can survive. This and, and if you look if you read the literature read, read the literature on the biosafety regulations, we know that basically that all of the, um, the the current regulations that were written basically with the idea of trying to prevent wood boring insects. Um, the the whole sort of um, uh, current regulate regulatory. Um, is sort of focus really uh, for that particular part of the um, the uh, federal code was really focused on you know wood boring insects, which was kind of the, the main risk and and so um, uh, microbes were really not really not a major consideration for this particular uh, commodity. So anyway, what we did is we did a little study and we decided let's see let's see let's see if we can really test this. Let's see if we can find if we can find living fungi and in, in, in we can we can really see if if there are, are if there are fungi present and if they are fungi that we can show were are not from here if they're fungi that are non-endemic um, so anyway the the, the wood products um, uh, that we tested like I said are, it's a part of a major supply chain there are many origins many you know many species. The regulations aren't necessarily uniform either, like I like I just mentioned, of course. Um, so um, there's this is not there's really very little enforcement. I, I think you can probably imagine that um, a lot of this is voluntary um, because APHIS just cannot inspect even like a very small percentage of what really comes in. Um, also, I forgot to mention this a lot. Rustic is very trendy right now, and I'll show you some pictures. But the whole idea of having things with the you know decay present with um, bark present is like very much, a, you know, part of sort of the trend. And so that does not bode well for having things that are clean, that are not going to be importing, you know, um, microbes and things. Pre I mean, that's actually going to increase the chances of, in, you know, importing um, microbes. So here's an example. This was one of those, you know, first bowls that I saw that, you know, that had bark present that kind of piqued my interest. Okay. So what we did was we sampled from the first, we had two studies. The first study was a, just a small one where we collected, um, we bought products from two retail stores in Gainesville. And we had a second study where we collected from four additional retail stores. So six stores total and 17 products. The samples were um, surface sterilized. Cultures were established from samples that were taken from the interior of the wood. This was all done in a, a biosafety cabinet. So we took a, a, a biosafety, did everything inside of a biosafety cabinet. Um, here's kind of some pictures of some of the types of products that we purchased, everything from, you know, wooden, uh, wooden bowls, like the one you see on the left from Indonesia. We bought, um, little, uh, pine cones that were, were imported from Italy. Um, that that's driftwood on the far right. Um, even wooden eggs of all things that were little packaged down there in the center, um, all sorts of products. Um, we did culturing onto selective different types of selective media, and um, and so then what we did is we identified the fungi that we grew out by sequencing the ITS region um, and then using 
uh, the bar, the sequence ITS barcode for identification using what's called blast searches. And we also incubated some of these wood products in um, these chambers to see if we could get fungi to grow out. In some cases we did, we got incredible fruiting bodies of these decay fungi, like some of the ones that we, we had, a, we had suspicion that were already there because of the, some of the things that we saw when we collected them. Like for example, this wooden bowl, we saw these black zone lines all over them whenever we bought them. So we suspect that we had a fungus there to begin with, which was Schizophyllum communi, which is a, 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 a decay fungus. Um, and this actually is a human pathogen, by the way. It actually can be a human pathogen and a decay fungus, by the way, which is kind of interesting. And here, here it is fruiting all over the, uh, the, the, you know, the, um, the product after it had been put into an incubation chamber over time. It produces these really cool fruiting bodies. This is that as it's just sort of just starting to come out. Looks like little hands coming out, reaching out, right? It's kind of cool. So. Um, so anyway, it's just kind of a, just a little summary. And it's, a, I mean, it's just a small, small little sampling just to kind of give you, a, you know, kind of a, a snapshot. But like I said, there were wooden bowls there. A lot of these were you are what used in wood in, excuse me, in food preparation and in, you know, associated with food, which I think is important to understand. Some of these were, were used in like craft, you know, making arts and crafts types of um, applications and in, um, and things like that. And here, these show you the, uh, this, these ta this table shows you the country of origin for the products. So most of them are Asia, but not all of them. There were a couple, there were a couple of things from uh, Europe and then also Mexico. Um, but, you know, most of them did yield fungi, not everything, but almost all of them did. And um, in some cases we got, you know, quite a few. And here, th this, don't, you don't need to worry about looking at this, this is way too small for you to see, but just just showing you some of the, you know, the, the diversity of fungi, this is where you're going to actually see what's interesting. So here, what we did, so we took all the fungi we found and we classified based on lifestyle. So what we, we did is we did used a bunch of different databases we use. So we, we tried what's called fungal traits, which is actually a database. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a, um, a program that allows you to search um, and, uh, well, you, we actually could take the sequence, sequence files we had and actually use that to, to classify the, the different, <clears throat> uh, species based on their, 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 um, their lifestyles. But we actually used a bunch of different databases. We use, um, we use my, we use Mike, let's, let's, let me think about this for a second. I actually have, have it here. So we use, um, uh, so we use MycoPortal. We use, uh, uh, let's see, we used uh, GBIF for, uh, uh, Mike, uh, for the um, biogeography. That tells you exactly where these, where these species have been found before. We used, um, uh, uh, let's see, MycoPortal, um, trying to remember the other ones actually off the top of my head, I can't remember. So we used several different databases here to do this um, and search against all the literature, the known literature for these species and identified um, whether or not they're known human pathogens, plant pathogens, and then uh, livestock and domestic pathogens. And then of course the rest are obviously because they were recovered from wood that we, we know that they're, sap they're saprophytes. And the, those that are, are in red um, font are um, non-endemic to North America or have never been found in North America before. And so, we have, um, at, so we have here at least um, uh, in, in this particular case, we have at least one human pathogen that's never been found in North America before, Pacillomyces formosus, which you see, which is also a, a crossover plant pathogen, which is interesting. So this species is a, a pathogen of trees. It causes a, uh, a dieback and canker disease of, of uh, pistachios and other, um, certain fruit crops in the Middle East, but it's also a, um, a opportunistic pathogen of humans. It causes cutaneous infections as well as lung infections in um, immunocompromised individuals as well as um, infants in Asia. And it's never been found in North America before. And here we found it associated with a couple of different samples in, in this particular uh, data set, which is you know, pretty concerning in my opinion. We also found a, um, 
a species called Bipolaris ostracipi, which is closely related to the rice blast pathogen, which is a you know major pathogen of rice, um, which is in fact has been associated with uh, um, you know major famine outbreaks. I mean, or, or major uh, outbreaks of rice to the point where it's caused famine previously um, in parts of Asia, and this is a new species never been found in North America before, and it was associated with a sample from uh, Thailand. And again, we, you know, this first report of ever finding that on anything in North America. So, um, you know, this, this is a, a, a pretty interesting uh, data set in a lot of ways, because of, uh, I think it actually cut off one more, there's a fourth one, which I'm, for, for whatever reason, it's the very bottom there, it's, it's Xyleria badia, which is a um, a decay fungus, but also so associated with um, um, orchids as well as a pathogen in Asia. And that one we um, on a sample from, uh, I believe it was found from the Philippines, but that species has only been for, uh, reported from uh, South China and also from Vietnam previously. And so that was the first, you know, the first, first find of that. So this you know, so this analysis, I think, you know, tells us just enough, just enough to say, look, there's a risk here. It, we really don't need to get down. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, obviously, we, we did some detailed analyses with this particular, um, particular analysis here. But I think what we're interested in is just looking at the pathway saying, look, there's a potential risk. And it's and it's it's a, a pretty significant risk. And another thing that we did was was to Look, look at the um, some of the traits that these 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 fungi have to say okay do these do these fungi have traits that make sense for um, surviving any of the potential bio um, the biosafety regulations that might be taking place or biosafety um, uh, processes that are taking place and and likewise a bunch of these species are in fact thermotolerant which makes sense um, a number of them are also halo tolerant meaning that they might survive if they are in fact um, being given any time, type of um, uh, methyl bromide treatment or you know um, or similar treatments, they they are in fact a number of them are tolerant of you know um, potentially tolerant of <clears throat> those types of treatments perhaps um, given some of these types of you know extremophile traits that they have being thermotolerant, halo tolerant, um, being tolerant of very dry conditions, being zero, zero tolerant for example. And so we looked at some of these other traits as well. So um, anyway, so this is, um, again, just a very small, you know, very small set, uh, sample so, uh, set, but I think it, 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 it sort of shows a, you know, connection um, there that um, could lead to um, some potential, uh, uh, tran you know, sort of transmission, you know, from one um, commodity into, you know, into the community and into potentially a lot of other commodities as well. So, um, here's, here's a wooden bowl from the Philippines that we recovered the Pacillomyces formosus. Like I said, this is a, a known human pathogen and tree pathogen found in Asia and the Middle East. It's not been found in North America before. Um, and then, and, and like I said, it, it causes, uh, cutaneous infections, um, in, you know, humans and there's an infant there, uh, probably shouldn't show that picture. Probably it's a little bit more than you guys wanted to see. Um, it also is a pathogen on, on oaks. And so that's pretty interesting. Cause like I said, what, what I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll get more into, you know, maybe more into summarizing this a bit more in a minute, but what, what, what we're trying, the picture that we're trying to kind of, I guess, or what I'm trying to illustrate here is that historically, you know, we have often, um, I guess we, the way we've looked at these pathogens is we've said okay this is a this is a pathogen of this host or a, that host but in reality microbes really don't live that way okay it's it's re, they're, they're re, we we've done that often because of of our 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 interest in trying to manage the the diseases that they cause or often because of the commodities that we work on i mean you know if you think about the way we work say as academics we you know we we often are focused on particular um commodities or whatever and, and and that and because we're looking at them through that lens we often sort of um we often really uh, have a myopic view of the natural histories of these of these microbes but in in reality 
their their natural his the probably the true natural histories, if you will, of these microbes it is much broader than that, and they really are you know m far more um, widespread in the landscape than we really give them credit for. And I think you know we're just we really are, at, at, in my opinion, at the very in infancy of really understanding that. And I think this you know trying to um, get a better picture of how the, there's so much connectivity between say plant pathogens and human pathogens is is really sort of an I think an interesting and important thing for us to to be able to to sort of wrap our heads around and grasp. So anyway, um, so let, let me move on here. So. Um, so another thing, so there, there was a, an interesting story uh, a couple of years ago, this, this guy died from um, something called bagpipe lung. This, you may have heard about this or maybe you didn't, but there was a guy died. He, he sort of died mysteriously and um, interestingly, infectious disease experts investigated to try to figure out why he died. And as it turned out, he, he was a bagpipe player in, in the UK and um, so one thing led to another, and they, they looked at you know, the inside of his bagpipe and turned out, you know, that was a really, believe it or not, a pretty disgusting place inside his bagpipe. I'm, I'm surprised. I would have thought it would be clean, but no, <laughs> uh, it was actually a, a perfect environment for a lot of molds and things to grow. And as it turns out, um, they, uh, some of the, the, the fungi that were growing in there um, there were a couple that were, you know, in, infectious and in, 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 in contributed to um, his death. And, um, you know, and I, I, I mean, that's an interesting story in and of itself, but I just wanted to point out that one of these, Pacillomyces ferariodii, is also one of the same fungi that we also recovered from one of these wood, wooden products. Um, another one that's used in food preparation. So we recovered this, um, it was this wooden um, cutting board here that um, was from China. And, and we, we, we recovered this fungus called Pacillomyces variadii um, from, from that particular um, product. And, and, it, and it also had this sort of interesting sort of wooden decay, this decay that, that you see all over, see that like white um, sort of um, sort of texture of the wood. That's actually from the decay going on on the wood there. That's all over it, and so the whole the whole board is sort of you know pockmarked with that decay, and that's a very specific type of decay going on. And again, that that I mean, there you know a lot of these companies are sort of selecting this kind of stuff because they think it looks cool or has like a certain you know texture or whatever. But that's that's the living fungus, you know, doing that. Now, not necessarily this fungus, but a different fungus doing it. But still, the point is, is that, um, you know, there's, there's, <laughs> you know, they're using the living organism here because it, it, it might look cool, but you're, you're, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's supposed to be a food preparation um, uh, piece, right? So that's maybe not necessarily what you want in that situation, perhaps, especially if it's going to be wet a lot, you know, and, then you know you're, you you may be you may be selecting a, a situation where you might might end up having problems perhaps. Um, so in, and again you know a question you might ask is what you know what didn't we find on the millions of of other samples that we didn't test you know I mean that, that to me that's a big a big 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 question big concerning one. So um, oh I think I'm going the wrong direction. Oh okay yeah there we go. So going forward um, so let me so let me go on to a different study. A more so this is a re more recent study that we're, I'm working on right now with a colleague of mine, uh, Lita Kobziar. She was a faculty member here um, in um, our school and then moved on to Idaho. And before she left, she and I started a project. Um, there was just a, a a little, just a little kind of one of those curiosity um, driven little studies that we weren't really sure what would happen. But it was it started out with a a simple question of you know how much how much living, you know, um, diversity in terms of microbes is there in, in wildfire smoke? And in, a, in, a, in a, at the time, you know, we were just kind of, you know, kind of, again, it was really just, really, that was the main question at the time. It had really no um, uh, connection, in, really, when you think, well, in relation to human health or anything, or, or forest health at the time, it was really just how much living microbe, um, microbial diversity is there. Although I, I, at the time I was kind of interested in, in whether or not um, plant pathogens are, are potentially spread that way. But um, 
so Salida came to to me and, and asked me if I'd be interested in in helping out with a little study. At, and she had a, a student um, who was doing this, and um, so my my student uh, Tyler helped, and we just kind of did a little little experiment where we basically uh, set up some um, sampling on the front end of a prescribed fire, you know, basically, and that's what you know what led to this little um, experiment. And um, as it turned out, there was a lot of diversity, a lot, and 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 so basically. From that study, we determined that A, there's a lot of, well, microbes survive in wildfire smoke. B, um, there's a lot of it and, 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 and it's, it's very diverse. And they're, um, they're also affected by the type of, of, of fuels that burn. You know, the fuels are very much a driver of what um, survives that in the wildfire smoke and in sort of what types of microbes. And, and at that time, um, in the, from this paper we published in Ecosphere, we coined the term pyroaerobiology to kind of like coin that whole, you know, um, you know, that whole area of study. And so we continued to um, be interested in this and continued to hypothesize about this, you know, and what it meant. But what, what one interesting thing that came up um, from this was, uh, you know, what, from wildfire smoke, um, was we, you know, I went back, I kept thinking about the cryptococcus thing and, and these emerging fungal diseases, because over time there became, you know, there was more and more information coming out about these emerging fungal pathogens globally. They were, you know, growing in emergence and, and so on. And so Lita and I kept kind of, you know, talking about, um, the possibility that there could be pathogens spread in there. And we, we already knew there were some, but, the, but how important were they? And what was really really interesting was that from all the literature on wildfire smoke, none of it ever even questioned the possibility that there could be infectious pathogens being spread in wildfire smoke, like zero. There was zero mentioning of it anywhere. Like, so there, and there was a lot of, you know, certainly a lot of literature on wildfire smoke and its, and its potential for being, a, you know, a, a problem for humans and and that it you know that it's uh it has all these potential ways that it influences human physiology it it, it affects our cardiovascular health and all these different things and 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 even and even the mechanics of it and in terms of it um the, the potential for toxins and um all these different things but there was zero mention of human pathogens not even hypothesizing anywhere and so we saw an opportunity and, and to, to do something about that and to, to, to at least study it. Um, so uh, Lita um, at one point brought it up for the first time in, in a, a little piece that she, she put out with um, a colleague of hers. They, they had an opportunity to write a little uh, perspectives piece in, in science. That was the first time that anything was mentioned on it. And we, she and I started to try to both generate some data and to um, try to get some funding for it. We wrote multiple proposals to um, and see to well NIH and to NSF and to multiple places, and we were turned down every single time. We tried multiple places, and it was um, it was sort of like they'd always say, "Wow, this is really really interesting. This is really really great idea," but eh, I don't know, you know, and we just we'd still get turned down every time. So ultimately, we we finally hit on something with the Keck Foundation because that's the right place to go for something that is everyone thinks is a great idea, but they won't fund. And so we ultimately got a, a grant funded where this we what we did was the idea was that we would take um, we would sort of look at this from a multi sort of a multi aim approach where we we um, we have somebody from the from the well. So from the public health perspective to be able to look at public health records. And so that's aim one. And so we've got um, Stephen Van Neen, he's from the, um, uh, the Kaiser, um, um, uh, Kaiser Permanente actually. Uh, and he's able to look at hundreds, well, over a hundred thousand uh, public health records per year going back 13 years. And he's looking at all the potential connections between wildfire events and fungal infections. And so that's basically his piece. And then we have Lita, and she is actually 
collecting uh, wildfire smoke samples from like from actual fires and quantifying you know the the microbial element of it looking at modeling the spread of the you know the microbes the 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 looking at how many of them are a lot the cells they're whether they're alive or dead that kind of thing and then she's collect sending those samples to us and we are um doing the characterization of them and characterizing what we have you know in terms of the species and um so on and so forth looking for actual pathogens we have some uh, we actually have somebody in the college of medicine uh dr born mirad he is actually um a respiratory health ex expert who uh, works on fungal pathogens, uh, especially those that, that affect the lungs. And he's focusing on sort of a clinical component of it. And then we have uh, Dr. Karen uh, Garrett, who's in the Emerging Pathogens Institute, and she's uh, helping us develop new epidemiological model, a uh, new epidemiological model to um, sort of explain this phenomenon and use machine learning approaches to kind of um, um, sort of uh, connect um, the components and uh, data from the study. And and basically, there there are there are multiple, like I said, there are multiple emerging fungal pathogens that are all growing in importance right now. And in, in I mean, just right, I mean, just here in the United States, you know, as, as one example, but they are, they're all growing and, and increasing in, in both incidence and severity. And um, the, this showing you a map of sort of where they are, you know, sort of their biggest problem are right now. But it, it, our main focus for this project happens to be the West Coast, where we have the biggest fire issues right now. So we're really keying in on when, when it comes to these major emerging fungal pathogens, it's, it's uh, coccidioides or coccidiomycosis and coccidioides species and uh, cryptococcus. But there are other fungal pathogens, the number of them that are, aren't listed on this list, which are in the West Coast, which we are um, focused on exploring and and, and and that includes a bunch of the um, yeast and candida species and things like that. So, so Lita is, is like I said, she's, she's gonna be creating these um, models based on the, uh, her sampling and being able to like, I mean, the idea would be to be able to even model individual pathogens if once we have data on them and, and being able to do these, um, these microbial uh, um, models, which are pr pretty cool. It's, it's based on the actual spread of the smoke itself. Um, you know, some other things that I just wanted to say about this is that, you know, people want to know like, how, how is it possible that that these pathogens can survive, you know, these these major wildfire events that get so hot. But the thing is, is that the fire temperatures are really heterogeneous. You know, even at the scale of a microbe, there's a lot of variability in the heat. And th these are some of Lita's slides, but I wanted to put them in here just so you you can see that. Um, and so there's a lot of variability. I mean, within a fire, a ton of variability, and and it's extremely they're extremely dynamic you know, events and that they're, they're lofting material at the very beginning of the fire as the fire moves. Um, and they're just massive, massively variable, I guess is one point to put it, one way to put it. Now, Lita has created an incredibly, um, I mean, I, I should say incredibly um, uh, complex and and sophisticated sampling system for sampling from the fires. And she should be given credit. It's really, really cool. She's done a lot of work on this, which inc includes sampling from the uh, from the fires using these drones, which have these um, payloads, which include uh, several different types of sample uh, sampling using these, um, these basically is the filter based uh, air samplers, which have, you know, which are able to accommodate for different uh, conditions and everything, but just suffice it to say, they, they there's a lot of work that's been, you know gone into this, and and she's done a lot of the science, are, you know, previously, and this is what really is important, very important for enabling us to get good quality samples that we know are from the actual smoke plumes versus from you know somewhere else and things like that, um, or that are not from the smoke plume, they're from you know in. Um, and, and then she's able to then get samples from ambient conditions uh, nearby so we can have comparisons and things like that. So we've been doing, you know, sampling, like I said, for a couple of years, doing different types of conditions. And we, you know, we, we are sampling on different types of media. The, and uh, these, are, these are some that um, grew a little bit too much before we could get to them. But it's just to give you an idea. There, there are 
I mean, it's, it's a, it's a zoo. I mean, there's a lot of different stuff in there and sometimes, sometimes we get a lot, sometimes we don't actually. So it just really depends on the samples. And, but just, a, just, just a couple of quick things to tell you about this, because we're still at the very beginning, really of this study, but there's about, I mean, you know, depending on who you talk to about 10%, maybe at most of the estimated three to 5 million fungal species have currently been identified. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of limitations to being able to identify what's there. Of course, we're, we're targeting some things that we know, you know, so that helps, but still we want to know kind of like everything that's there. Um, there's a lot of ecological niches, um, variable recovery between taxa, of course, some fungi you can culture, a lot of fungi you can't. Um, and so where do you begin? So we, we're using both culture-based approaches and culture-independent approaches. We're using both um, molecular, you know, sequencing approaches using next generation sequencing approaches and these culture based approaches, which are complex and sometimes very difficult. And we get very different pictures of what's there using those things. And then both of them will miss stuff, you know, both of them will miss um, fungi, some fungi that can be detected with one approach can't be detected with the other. Um, I'm not Yeah, I, I won't waste a lot of time on that, but I I'd like to show, I actually would like to show you some data though. Like, so these are from some samples that we got from Lita this past um, fall. And I, I'm not even putting any identifications on here because that, that doesn't really matter. But these are, this is a set of samples from a fire. And this is with next generation sequencing of the ITS. And so what, what I want to say was, okay, so we get, we get these samples and we, we did sequencing to identify, okay, these are, these are all different individual taxa, okay, being represented here. And then the bar, the size of the bar is the abundance of them, you know, based on the sequence reads. But then what we do with that is we then we we sift through that to find, okay, what what are what are the known pathogens present? And we and then we compare we compare them to, to try to identify what are the known known human pathogens. And and what we've been trying to do is say, can we find overlap? You know, can we find can we find species that are like, you know, that are being a bunch, you know, that are showing up um, the same, you know, that are showing up uh, uh, frequently or showing up across different samples and not just not just across different samples, but across different sites from one site to another and that kind of thing to see if we're, we're finding patterns. And so like, and, and really this first, this first week, we just got our funding starting in July. So we, this was really just about, mostly about um, starting to get some of our um, methods worked out more than anything. Really now, next season is when our, our real sampling really starts. So we're still kind of trying to get our, our methods worked out, but, um, but we'll, we'll see, but we are, I mean, we're definitely starting to identify, finding some, some pathogens. So far, we've not identified any of those target pathogens yet. Um, that we're that we're looking for. So we'll see. It'll be interesting to see if we identify anything like you know, cryptoc the like cryptococcus. We did get we have gotten some cryptococcus, just not cryptococcus gaudii, um, in some of the samples. And we have gotten. Um, I mean, coccidioides is a very difficult one because it cannot be cultured, and um, it's it's pretty tricky. So we'll we'll see if we identify it. But we've not sampled in the areas where it's the most abundant, like in the Southwest. All of our sampling's been in Northern California and Idaho so far. So we'll see about that. So the goal, though, with this is really to, like I said, is it's really to identify, you know, I mean, identify, obviously, if there are any of these infectious disease pathogens, um, you know, that are potentially spread, try to develop, develop new models. Um, but there's a lot of other, you know, sort of secondary things, like I said, you know, developing new um, models for these pathogens, looking at potential adaptations, biogeography, um, you know, even it'll even help things like um, with air, mon air monitoring and things like that, because it, it may change the way we look at smoke and stuff like that. So I don't know, I think it's a pretty interesting little little study. Um, we are doing some other things that I didn't have time to talk about. Um, one is that we are um, a little project that I have going on, a little side project, uh, which is, is kind of interesting. A student of mine is currently looking at um, uh, imported food products and um, poten potential for spread of, 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 of fungal pathogens on, on um, uh, food and also like supplement, like herbal supplements and stuff like that that are, they're imported. If you go to a lot of these 
like Asian markets and stuff, there's there's a lot of stuff that kind of slips under the you know sort of under the radar in terms of the regulatory process. And and there's a lot of I mean there's all kinds of stuff. There's like dried mushrooms and dried all kind you know just if you go we go look you'll see there's all kinds of stuff. And a lot of that we think um, you know is is risky in in that regard. Um, we also did a study. It's a little bit maybe even further a field, but might be of interest to you, um, where we looked at um, vape devices, um, e like e-cigarettes, vape devices as um, incubators for for mold and fungi to be uh, to get established. And um, we re just recently finished that study, and um, we're trying to get that published now, but we found that actually fungal pathogens get very well established in those devices. And there's actually adaptations there for a lot of um, these yeasts that uh, actually they, they, a lot of them are known to be problems in clinical settings because the, a lot of the same species get established like in ICU units and stuff because they can grow on plastics. We found the same species growing in inside of these um, vape devices. And some of them get are very bad problems in um, clinical settings. Uh, these uh, yeast species that get established like on, uh, um, you know, on catheters and stuff like that, the same, some of the same species, and, and they, some of them are pretty bad, and they're, they seem to be pretty common inside of um, vape devices, so pretty interesting. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. It's kind of an, I don't know, kind of a, a little bit odd, probably, for this group, maybe a little bit different, but um, we're, you know, and one more thing I want to say about the fire stuff is, you know, a lot of people, I think, you know, when they initially hear about this, they think, oh, you know, maybe we're trying to say like, you know, fires are bad or something like that. And and, and that that is absolutely not the case at all. Um, you know, we're very cognizant of, you know, the importance of fire in our landscapes and that, you know, fires are, you know, clearly part of our ecology. What we're trying to do is, first of all, A, understand, you know, I, in more nuance, what, you know, the interaction between fires and microbes. and uh, B, I think that, you know, one of the things is that, you know, with these big mega fires that occur on the West Coast, per, and, and that's really what we've been studying, is that some of the phenomena that occur there in relation to human health um, are, you know, are, they're, they're, they're definitely nuanced. And they, uh, you know, maybe there, there's a big, just, a much bigger justification for, for introducing fire, at, you know, as a management tool in terms of controlled burns. We know that this is something that, you know, um, there's been a, you know, there's been a lot of resistance historically for the use of control burns as a, you know, as a management tool. Um, but I just, I just, you know, I think I've, I've, you know, when I've presented on this in the past, I've had people simply say, oh, you know, or, you know, are you saying we should stop having, I mean, what, you know, what, what if you find human pathogens are spread in, in wildfire smoke? Is that going to make, be making, you know, sort of um, providing fodder for people to say that we shouldn't, you know, have fires anymore or something? And I and I I think you know that's it's it's a much more nuanced discussion than that, and it's definitely not not what certainly not what I'm saying here. So anyway, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Jason, thank you. That was really really interesting. I know um, you know as you were talking about your first study, I'm like mentally going through like the items in my house. <laughs> and I'm like, did I buy anything with bark on it? Like, um, but uh, yeah, no, this is really interesting. I also want to thank you too because this is obviously you know really highly technical and. Um, you know, as a sociologist, this is, you know, way out of my field, but that was, I, you know, I was following you the whole way. So, um, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. So I know that um, we're a little bit like over time, just a tad. Um, so if anybody has to go, that's fine. But Jason, if you don't mind just staying for maybe like two, three minutes to see if we have some questions. Sure thing. Be happy to. Okay. All right. So I'll open it up to questions for anybody who is able to stay. Um, hi, thank you for that presentation. And that was very informative. I really enjoyed it. Um, I just had one question about the conditions of the incubation. I'm not sure if you mentioned this already, but um, mm. so when you put one of the wooden um, pieces of, you know, that you bought from the store into an incubation chamber, what were those conditions like in the chamber? And could those, you know, be replicated like in a house? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. So in our, in this in this case, um, we so yeah. So in this case, we actually only incubated at at room temperature. We did not incubate at thirty seven. For most of our studies, we are incubating at 
So for the smoke study, we're incubating at 37 because we're actually selecting for human pathogen. Like we're, you know, we're trying to select for human pathogens and stuff. In this case, we we selected for, uh, we we selected at room temperature to see what would grow at, at 30 at, at room temperature first. So it, so there's no guarantee, and and that's a and actually you point to a, a, a probably a bit of a limitation for that study. If just because we select we um, found species that are known to be human pathogens does not necessarily mean that uh, they um, you know at, at the at the strain level possess the pot potential to be pathogenic, right? So if uh, if they can grow at twenty at twenty four or twenty five, which is room temperature, they may not necessarily be you know able to grow at thirty seven. Right. You know what I mean? Okay, true. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, so the next step would be to, you know, and that'd be a good thing to do would be to say, okay, can these grow at 37? Can they tolerate 37? They do. Now, if you saw that table I put uh, up the second table, I said, you know, these are known to be thermotolerant, you know, and I mean, from the right. literature and stuff, which suggests, you know, they probably at least at the species level have that capacity, but we don't know for sure if those strains that we selected, you know, do. We didn't do, we haven't done that yet, but, but that's a okay. good that's cool. a that's a that's a good question you know um i i think um uh, one thing I, I would i would say though is that like another thing that um my, so it's just an anecdote but it's something i i wanted to say my mom um she's she's getting to be up there and she's not elderly elderly but let's just say she's older and uh she she has a condo in fort myers she lives up north but she goes down this down south and she um she sometimes my brother goes down to her condo and stays when she's not there and stuff so uh, a couple of years ago my brother went down there to visit or to hang out in her condo and he he was down there for I don't know, a week or something and he went back and then my mom went down after him so my brother was there and he was in a hurry to go to the airport to leave and so he he put some stuff in her dishwasher and then he left and one of the things he put in her dishwasher was a uh, wooden, some sort of wooden toy. I don't know if it was a wooden spoon or something he put in dishwasher and then he left and my mom came back and opened it up and she sent me a picture of this because she kind of knows some of the things that I'm interested in studying, but the, the wooden spoon and everything around it was completely covered with mold. Like, I mean, oh just completely, oh. completely covered because it, you know, he closed it up and I don't know if it, the dishwasher didn't finish the, the cycle or just the humidity in there after, you know, but it allowed for this mold to grow on there. And it, and it was like, com you know, completely covered. And what, fr what, um, furthermore, my mom is a, um, she's a liver transplant uh, recipient and she's also on dialysis and she also has cancer, by the way. So I'm telling you guys way more than you know here, but she, let's just put it this way. She is in like the top, top, top category of like, yeah. you know, susceptible type people for any kind. I mean, if she could, if she could get cryptococcus, you know, she'd get it. So if there were, let's say one of these pathogens that were on there and on, let's say a wooden product, and you had a situation like that, and let's say she opened up her dishwasher and all those spores, millions and millions, billions of spores, really. And she opened up that dishwasher. Can you imagine? And and they just it went right into her lungs. That's very. I can scary. envision. I can envision a scenario where that would be a perfect opportunity for somebody to get. You know. Yeah. So it really, didn't wouldn't take, like. Oh, I mean, I, anyway, I'm just pointing out that's like a perfect pathway of transmission right there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, thank you for answering that. Yeah. Oh. So I think very relatedly, um, Bethany asked in the chat, would you recommend not using wooden cookware? I mean, not necessarily. I mean, I think wooden cookware is probably okay. It's just like, I mean, I wouldn't put it in a dishwasher like that if I were doing it. I'd probably let it dry, right? You know, do it the right way. And, and then, I mean, I think buying domestic is probably good too, if you can. Like, I think that's a good idea. I mean... I don't know, but the thing is that we don't really know, I think the risk, I mean, so, okay. So the biggest risk probably to humans right now is yeast. Candida species are a big problem because we get, we we're susceptible to yeast, definitely to candidas and 
they are, and also know your own potential risk. So like, again, for the average person who's healthy, he's got a healthy immune system, probably most of these things aren't going to be a major problem. But if you're somebody like my mom, who, I mean, she's super susceptible to everything. So like somebody like that, I feel like they, they just probably should probably low, you know, take a lower risk of, you know, from anything. I, I don't know, but how, you know, you, you have to, I, I don't know that we really know. Um, I, here's, I, I will say this. I'm, I'm, um, I'm planning to, I'm talking to somebody about doing a sabbatical here soon, um, with a, um, a colleague who, who studies kind of this kind of stuff, like how, how infections happen and how they get, um, into clinical settings. And he studies like, like things like, um, uh, I mean, linens, like how, you know, they, linens in the hospital setting, you know, carry pathogens um, from, you know, a, a, a laundry where the laundry setting was not right. And they, they got a pathogen from there to, you know, a, you know, the operating room, you know, and I mean, it was a big problem. They had a huge problem with that. So, so stuff like that. I mean, I guess it can make you paranoid too, if you, if, but, but, I, but, the, but that nuance to me is pretty fascinating. And again, I mean, I'm, I, 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 I'm more interested though, personally with trying to break down the barrier, like tr trying to break down that barrier between just simply looking at things from, you know, like I said, just looking at it, for, at it on the, you know, in one ecosystem or one host, but rather trying to understand the broader connect connectivity and tr really truly looking at the, the interactions and a little bit broader. I think that's a really interesting thing because I think by doing that, you know, we, we, we have a, a little bit, you know, well, a better understanding of how these organisms work, how, how they've really evolved and, 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 re, and realistically perhaps better management overall. And in particular, we're talking about these invasive, I mean, I've been fighting, I've been banging my head against the wall for years, trying to get people interested in fungal pathogens of trees as invasive organisms, you know, trying to stop their introductions, trying to get people on board with like this idea that like, look, we've got these major fungal pathogens coming in all the time. They're, they're wiping out species. We need to do something about it. But it's been an uphill battle getting really getting any kind of like major traction on anything. But if we really look at it as a bigger, as a, as a, a sort of a, as one thing, fungal pathogens period being introduced. Like that's the, that's the problem. It's not just fungal pathogens of trees, fungal pathogens of pigs, fungal path. I mean, it's fungal pathogens period. Right. And, and realistically they, they, and, and I think that the truth is they really are capable of doing a lot of things and in their shifts in their behavior that are happening because of anthropogenic activities, because of our, our globalization and, ch and, and everything from climate change to use of fungicides to use of, um, you know, the way products are being moved and stuff. We just need to like sort of broaden a little bit understand and, and sort of change our, I think the way we conceptu have conceptualized these. And if that makes sense, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe I, I'm, I, I, I I don't know, maybe I don't make a lot of sense, but that's the way I see it. I, I'm looking at it a little bit differently. I'm trying not to, you know, trying not to even, I, I guess, I'm, I'm trying to redefine even what, what forest health really means because I, I, don't, I think it's really broader. I mean, I, I truly do. I think that it, it's, it's an ecosystem, you know, I mean, that, that really involves a lot of stuff. And, it, and these, like I said, these, you know, wood is wood you know, and it's, it's, it, whether it's in your kitchen that you're using, you know, that you're, you're cooking off of, or it's, um, it's in, it's still in the forest. It's still either, either place. It's those, those microbes that you're in, that, that, that are interacting with that wood, they're, you know, they're still, I mean, you know, there's, they're, they're going to come out and they're going to interact with whatever they interact with, period. Um, I don't know. So anyway, hopefully, that makes some sense, but I'm, I'm, it's still evolving in my head as well. And I think, I think we're still trying, we're still trying to wrap our heads around what all, all of this means. And I think there's a, a lot of potential to, to collaborate. Um, and I'm definitely interested in like, and I think there are, there is definitely social um, components to this. I think there, uh, there, you know, there's a lot of different aspects that we still have to, um, you know, connect with and broaden out with, you know, so. If anyone's interested in and in see something here that I'm, you know, that that you see an opportunity or whatever, let me know, please. I'd be happy to hear it for sure. So reach out to me. 
Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, I have another meeting that I have to jump on um, at three o'clock, which um, oh, is in a minute. But um, go. uh, I want to remind everybody that's still on um, the Dr. Smith's um, um, contact information is on the flyer. If you have um, some additional follow up questions, um, that's how you can get in touch with him. Um, but Jason, thank you again so much. This is fascinating, and I very, very much appreciate you joining us. Well, thank you. It was great. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Take care now. Awesome. All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.